So I'm going to talk to you today and give you a bit of an, an outline of this new training centre that we've recently been awarded. Uh, Yasmina Sultanbauer, who's not with us today, I believe she's, she might be out at community at the moment. I think she's coming back at the end of the week. Um, she uh, is the director of this new training centre and, and put all of this together for us and I've been working with her on that. And it is about uh, uniquely Australian foods. And if you're not sure what an industrial transformation training centre is, uh, it's an, an initiative that the Australian Research Council have put out where um, it started probably five, six years ago, I think, were the first of the, the training centres which came through. And it really is about trying to transform an industry by investing in um, developing new industry leaders for that industry in the future. And it really is comprised around 10 PhD students who are studying a particular focus area. Um, this one's about uniquely Australian foods and that those 10 PhD students would end up being industry leaders and um, ambassadors for that industry in the future. And here is our lovely little logo down the bottom. So, so what is the problem? Where is, why are, are we doing this? Why do we need uh, to think about uniquely Australian foods? Well, we know that worldwide we have a lack of diet diversity, both in um, developing countries and um, also developed countries as well. The most of sorts of foods that we eat don't have a, a huge amount of nutritional properties in them, things like rice and corn, and uh, we really do require a, a diverse diet to be able to be healthy people. We also throw out a huge amount of food. Food waste is an issue that I don't need to educate all of you on. A massive amount of food is wasted um, from <coughs> production, but also from the end user, the consumer throws out. Um, something like one in five shopping bags of food that comes home. Some numbers say up to something like 40% of food that comes into the home is thrown out. But it's also lost throughout the, the supply chain as well. Um, and also we have this issue of hidden hunger as well. The Food and Agriculture Organisation of the United Nations um, have put out a um, rule for future food production, the 10-2070 uh, rule, to be able to supply the future food demand that we have globally. And they express that as being 10% expansion, 20% in intensification, and 70% innovation, which is where we as uh, food sciences, scientists need to come on board. There's also an increasing market um, for functional foods and ingredients that we've seen. There's a trend. Um, there's a rise in, in chronic disease amongst consumers. They're aware of this. And it really is driving them towards making healthier food choices because they know that um, to up, to, up till now, the diet that they've been um, consuming really has been living them down in terms of, of health outcomes. The global functional food market is 130 billion uh, uh, US dollars and it's 1.1 billion in Australia. Global functional food ingredient market is 2.54 billion in 2007 um, US dollars and 3.18 billion is predicted for 2023. So we really are expecting to see a big um, climb, a big uh, growth in that food functional ingredient market as well. Some of the challenges that we face in this area is that there is uh, government legislations imposed on how you can label particular food products in terms of the, the benefits of the nutritional components that are present there. And also consumers generally are fairly unaware of how to, to use um, these products that are healthy for them and foods that are healthy for them and incorporate those into a healthy diet. However, um, here is, presents itself a new opportunity for us in Australia. We produce a, um, we have naturally in Australia occurring a huge range of different botanicals and plant foods, which we know are full of uh, many phytonutrients and the like that can be used as either functional foods or functional ingredients. And that really is where this training centre has, um, has been born from. It's a $3.6 million um, training centre and it really is about converting traditional indigenous ethnobotanical knowledge, so cultural knowledge and uses of plant foods, into branded products and looking for opportunities to do that. Um, here are the goals of the training centre, to develop sustainable business models involving all stakeholders by identifying both the social factors and also um, the beneficial aspects of indigenous participation across the value chain from both the raw ingredient and into the finished food. Also to identify the characteristic sensory properties of these interesting um, native plant foods that provide uniqueness and justify a premium brand position. 
We also need to consider any toxicological issues um, and safety issues and make sure that we've, we've covered those bases to make sure that the, the new ingredients and new plant for, foods that we're exploring don't actually make anyone sick, but also that they have access to major markets and there, there aren't um, limitations on that. And lastly, to characterise the nutritional profiles of these ingredients to understand what premium product applications might be available to us. So I've got a little video now which, um, it, which was put together for us. It's still a, a draft form. Um, we're just getting all of our media clash all together, aren't we, Margaret? Uh, so don't worry about the, uh, <laughs> if there's any copyright symbols across the video. Uh, this was just draft one. But it helps describe the opportunity that we're trying to access. Okay, um, this diagram is just showing us, I guess, some of our uh, R&D inputs and also industry inputs and outputs and outcomes from the project. Um, but if I can just draw your attention to the centre of these, I'll expand on these a little bit more. Um, the different components of the project, it's a, a, a collaboration. We have the law school involved, some of the law school are here today, thanks for coming along. We also have social sciences are involved at UQ as well, and also coffee um, and our food group. So we're going to be considering social factors, Indigenous participation will be a central point of what we'll be focusing on, composition and sensory quality, bioavailability and nutritional quality, food toxicity and sa food safety, and also trademarking and benefit sharing will be some of the, the components that we are exploring. At the top here, we have ch eight chief investigators, three international collaborators, three postdoctoral scientists and 10 PhD students who are going to be involved. And in terms of our partner organisations, I've, I've got their logos on the, the last page, but we have the um, uh, ANFAB, who's the uh, national body for native foods in Australia, uh, uh, native foods and botanicals, I should say. We also are working with um, Kindred Spirits Foundation, who are uh, a group that look after Indigenous training and empl employment and welfare across Australia and are involved in a number of different philanthropic type of projects to be able to benefit communities. Um, we are also working with um, Venus Shell Systems, who are doing seaweed um, down in, in New South Wales. We're also working with Be Inventive, that's a company that's developed the new flow frame for um, honey. You may have seen um, the Australian story on that as well. And we're also working with Karen Sheldon Catering, who's one of our partners from the Northern Territory in Darwin. And they do a lot of, um, uh, they, they're a catering company, but they do a lot of work in Indigenous training and employment and training Indigenous um, trainees to make um, foods that actually end up both being consumed commercially by um, everyday population, but they also go back into communities, to canteens, to be able to feed Indigenous people in remote locations as well. So they're very passionately um, working with us. 
We also have a large number of um, Indigenous enterprises that, um, who have collaborated with Yasmina and myself over, over many years, and they're also involved in the project. Um, they're not um, a listed partner in the project, but they've come on board to help share knowledge and material um, so we'll be able to do the work that we'll be doing. Um, so those are those industry inputs, and I'll talk about some of these outputs and outcomes a little bit more later. Um, so just a bit more on those different areas. Um, so Janine Baxter is, is here on the left here. Alison Fish, Brad Sherman are from the law school. Janine's from social sciences. And then um, Jason Stokes is from um, the School of Chemical Engineering. I've done a lot of collaborations with him on mouthfeel and texture and understanding processing of, of foods and how um, that in fact packs um, sensory qualities. And then of course, Mike Gidley, um, who you well know, um, Yasmina at the front here and myself and also Michael Netzel, all from Coffee, um, focusing on the nutritional components of the food, the bioavailability of the ingredients and also the sensory properties and any food applications will be the, the parts that we take care of there as well. The Australian plant products that we're actually going to be studying are shown here. We have a whole range of different sorts of herbs and spices. Um, bush tomato and salt bush I've worked with a fair bit before. Um, Gulban and Gillingung uh, make tea. They're actually from North and Western Australia and they're used as a tea product at the moment. have some amazing sorts of flavours and properties. There's not a lot that we know about those, but there is a lot of Indigenous knowledge in using those in specific applications. Um, we have some native fruits, the burdekin plum and the green plum. Uh, we'll also be looking further down the chain at uh, kakadu plum, which is a much more developed industry at the moment. Uh, native nuts, the pinzan walnut and the bunya nut. I'm not sure if you've ever had any of those. There's some processing issues with the bunya nut. They're about this big and um, uh, they grow for on very huge, very huge trees and drop like bombs when it's time for them to come down. So there's some, some issues ar around that, but we'll be exploring that with a community out at Sherberg. Um, wattle seeds, there are many, many different types of wattle seeds across Australia. Um, I think there's something like 3,000 different species of wattle um, to begin with, and I don't think we can eat all of them. I think there's only a select few that we can eat. I've smelt and tasted about 12 different types. They're incredibly interesting. They range from smelling like your, you know, your roasted coffee chocolate all the way through to smelling like pork crackling or spices or this one that smells like capsicum. They really, they really do um, vary enormously, size and shape and, and everything. Um, but we're going to certainly learn a little bit more about wattle seeds. And down the bottom here, we're going to be looking at honeys made from, um, made obviously from uh, European honeybees in this new flow hive system and explore how, um, how honeys from different native botanicals, um, what the flavour of those particular honeys have. And the benefit of this system is actually that it preserves the authentic floral notes coming from the plant. Um, it, you don't have to spin and heat the honey when it's extracted. It's a very simple, gentle extraction system. Um, I didn't like honey until I tasted honey from a, a flow frame, I'll, I'll be quite honest with you. Commercial honey often is very oxidised that you buy at the shop and you just have those sorts of bruise characteristics, but honey from these frames is something else entirely. It's, it's amazing. It's incredibly floral and, and I think it's what <laughs> honey should be like. And uh, native seaweed as well. I mentioned we're working with, um, with Pia Winberg um, from Venus Shell Systems in New South Wales. And she, um, it, this is a really exciting opportunity as well. We don't eat a lot of Australian sea, uh, seaweed in Australia. There are many countries that do have a lot of seaweed in their diet. Uh, we have some of the most diverse seaweed species that exist and edible sea species, seaweed species at, at that. Um, I don't know a lot about whether or not Indigenous people have been eating seaweeds as part of their diet. That's not something um, I've ever come across, to be honest, and I've asked that question in a lot of different um, situations. Um, so really, there's an amazing opportunity of some incredibly diverse and different seaweeds, which we know are full of, full of healthy nutrients um, that could be incorporated into our diets. And P is growing those on a, on a larger scale now and looking for new product um, opportunities there. So the 10 projects can be split across, um, I guess, this, this continuum here from traditional knowledge at the very beginning through understanding the composition and properties, identifying a proof of principle in, a, in an application, developing a business model, market value validation through to branded products on the right-hand side here. And, those, and as, a, as these projects, um, some of them are right back at the very beginning, understanding 
traditional use and knowledge of herbs and spices and then doing some compositional work to understand what's in it. Um, same for some of those fruits and the nuts. Um, kakadu plum, as I said, is, is well past all of that. We, we have profiled kakadu plums in depth and we have some business opportunities for kakadu plum at the mo moment, but we're sort of looking at where to next with kakadu plum, so that's much further down. Similar for honey, um, and it's about market value distinction in the honey project and understanding what those regional qualities are of the native botanicals and being able to, to maximise opportunities and understanding there. And down the bottom here, obviously exploring those social factors and the benefits of Indigenous participation. The trademarking and benefit sharing, making sure that when we do these sorts of projects that value goes back to community and value that they appreciate as well, not just monetary value, but values that they, that they actually have. And then finally, a project here over here, um, the number 10, Market Insights, is really understanding the value for distinctive and uniquely Australian foods, both in Australia and overseas. What, what is it that people value about those particular products? What sorts of marketing messages should we be getting out and should we be using um, to be able to, I guess, empower those new businesses that come from this project and that are already existing to be able to market those products to those target markets in the right way? Uh, so here are some of those outcomes, um, which I didn't go into in too much detail earlier on that early, earlier slide. Obviously, training, we're going to have these 10 PhD um, completions. We would love to have 10 Indigenous PhD students. That isn't really a reality for us in the sciences. There's not an enormous number of students who are going through the sciences to be able to, to come and, and participate in our projects. However, we would love that to be the case. But we're going to do a lot of work um, during the training centre in training um, school students and also TAFE students and working with Kindred Spirits and other organisations who are working at mentoring Indigenous um, uh, trainees who are just out of high school or towards the end of high school, so that maybe in 10 years' time we can say that an entire training centre like this could easily be filled by Indigenous participants, which would be fantastic. But we're doing a lot of work in that area. We had a workshop only, was it a week ago or two weeks ago, um, with some Indigenous trainees from, um, from UQ and also staff members who are part of the Indigenous program here at UQ. Obviously, we're looking to develop new products and some of these things I've already mentioned. Um, the last, I guess, several months, I've been spending some time with our industry partners and also our scientists and talking about each of our projects in, in more detail. And um, as part of that, I, I guess we've developed a new, a new idea as part of this project, which we'd like to be an output at the end, which I would like to mention. And uh, that is developing a tool for analysing the potential benefit from native botanical, for the potential benefit from native botanicals development. And what I mean by that is, and this isn't necessarily my area, I'm, I'm a flavour scientist, however, this is looking at business models. Um, most of our business models are around uh, the economics, understanding the cash value at the end of these inputs, and this is what we get at it, is, is the equation balanced and will you make money from it at the end? Well, not all Indigenous communities are interested in making lots of money. Um, from exploiting their um, native botanicals. And there are other values that that community might have, like meaningful employment on country or um, investing in, in schools or health or, or education locally uh, or sharing their cultural knowledge and preserving that for the future. Um, or maybe even just being happy and enjoying, <laughs> enjoying life. Imagine that if we based all our business decisions on, on ha happiness quotient. Well, actually, that's something that's being discussed in business circles, I can assure you. And something that we'd like to see coming from this is when we go through this process of evaluating, as scientists, we break down the, the new plant material that we have. What's in it? What does it do? What could we do with it? Well, that's not the only questions we need to be asking. What's the benefit for the community? How would they like to see this product being used? Would they like to share that traditional knowledge? Would they not like to share that traditional knowledge? Would they prefer to do something over here instead? Um, so really, we'd like to see that as an outcome of this project, an output that people can use in the future to be able to explore the value of new opportunities in native foods and ingredients in Australia. Just going to close now with a couple of videos from some of our um, Indigenous um, enterprises. Um, this is Bruno Dan. He's an elder from um, the Kimberley region in Western Australia from the Nul Nul tribe. And uh, he actually is an, a very rare native title holder. And he's just going to talk a little bit of what about 
um, his thoughts on this project. Oops, and I've gone right past him to Madonna. Hang on. Here's my mouse. My name's Madonna. We're also working with um, some communities that are, mu are much closer to us. Um, so this is Madonna um, Thompson. She's from the Jagra people and she uh, has a business locally and I'll let her explain for herself. That's great. If you want to find out more information, we are soon to have a, a website. Down the bottom here is our, is our uh, web. On the top, we have a web link to the grad school where we're currently advertising some of the, the first round of the PhD projects. We're going to be advertising those over the next sort of six to nine months. Um, not different projects at different times. Obviously, the closing dates of the three that are currently being advertised, are, and one's in a, a week, I think, and another couple are in three weeks' time. So if you know anyone who would like to do a PhD on one of these projects, um, please pass the information on to them. We'd love to hear from them. Otherwise, they can contact Yasmina or myself. And uh, I think that's all I was going to present. Yeah, so here are some of the logos of the, the partners that we're working with and um, also acknowledging the ARC and the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries um, and the University of Queensland, obviously, as partners of this project. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? <laughs>